Scalia, who will enlighten us and help us. It's good to have you with us, Father.
follow my own opinion, which is different from conscience. Or I have to follow what I feel is right, which is different from conscience. Or more likely, I just don't agree with you. Uh, so in light of that, I think we do need to step back and, uh, and review what exactly is a conscience, how does it work, how can it work better, and what are the means for getting it to work better? So, you know, what is it? Is it a little voice? You know, in the back of that, is it a good angel and a bad angel? You know, on, on the shoulder. You know, what, what exactly is it? And so, um, I think Soren sent around this very exciting handout. Um, I, there, somebody else has a has a neat sort of technological display over here. I have handouts from the Catechism. Okay, very, very exciting stuff, and I, I see that some of you, you look tired because you were up late last night uh, reading. <laughs> um, but this is the, the handout that was on the table there as y'all came in. And uh, really, I can't do any better than to just point it to, to what the church has given to us and, and try to, um, to explain it further. And so in the Catechism, talking about the conscience, it says, moral conscience present at the heart of the person, enjoins him at the appropriate moment to do good and to avoid evil. Now let's just pause over that, that one clause there, present at the heart of the person. And so the conscience is something that is already within us, already present there. And this quote that I provided, and I suspect is from the Catechism, not from me directly, uh, from St. Augustine, and he says, we could never judge that one thing is better than another if a basic understanding of the good had not already been instilled in us, already been instilled in us, present at the heart of the person. So the conscience is a capacity, um, in effect a spiritual power, that is already present to us, that has been instilled in us. We should see this from a very early age. Uh, if mom or dad expressed displeasure with little Johnny, who's just done something, really not awful, but it's, you know, it, it, he needs to be corrected for it, uh, then he's upset when he sees their displeasure. Because little Johnny already has, in rudimentary form, this sense that there is something good and something evil and that I should do the good and avoid the evil. And my sort of gauge for what is good and evil is mom and dad. If I'm getting a scowl from mom, I've probably stumbled into something evil, and I need to get back to what is good. And uh, years ago, I was uh, giving instruction to, to uh, parents who were preparing to visit first, or first confession. And one of the parents asked, well, when are you going to go over all of the sins? When are you going to tell the kids what you know what the sins are? Um, they know already, and uh, actually, in a lot of ways, they know better than we do, because their consciences are still sort of you know much more malleable. <laughs> they have the hard ways uh, ours have a lot of times. And these kids, their consciences are already functioning pretty well, which is why they need to go to confession. Okay? <laughs> they know when they've done wrong because more likely mom and dad have told them when they've done wrong. And please, God, have affirmed them when they've done right. This is from the earliest years, the formation of conscience. You've done right here, so I affirm you. You've done wrong here, so I rebuke or, or discipline you in some manner. And so it's already there. It's been instilled in us. Now, um, I hope everyone here can understand this next analogy, not just those um, from IT department. <laughs> but every single one of us has, and hopefully it's in the pocket and it's turned off, or at least the ringer's turned off, okay, some phone or some device that we have, it has instilled in it something that is searching for a signal. It's already in there. It's been instilled by the maker, by the creator. It's already in there. And it is already searching to know. It's designed that way. Uh, and so, you know, your, your phone, uh, you know, the good people at, at uh, you know, Verizon or Sprint or wherever, you know, kind of instilled something in there that is looking for the information that they have to give. 
uh, your Bluetooth piece is, you know, it's got something in it that searches for a signal and so on. The GPS system in your car, in your phone, in your iPad, whatever else, uh, it has something instilled in it that is searching for that satellite so that it can get the proper information and then give it to you. In each instance, so this is not hard for us to understand at all because we are the ones who created these things. In each instance, we see the importance, let's eat, let me instill something in this device so that it is actually more beneficial, more useful. It's, it's a higher level than just sort of a, you know, a landmine. I mean, some people still use those things. Incredible. Okay. But this is a higher, more noble device because now they can kind of search for something in effect on its own. So that is uh, sort of a, a rudimentary understanding of just what the conscience is. It is this, this power placed within us to know good and evil. And what is its function there? And so moving on to a section called the judgments of conscience. The conscience, uh, as the per very first paragraph of the page says, it bears witness to the authority of truth. So that is one duty of the conscience, to bear witness to the truth, to give you an understanding of what it is. And then the conscience renders judgment. Renders judgment. Now, this in our society is sort of a bad word. Judgment, or to be judgmental, uh, to judge. We kind of lump all of those things together. To be judgmental is an awful thing because it's basically you look at somebody who is perhaps objectively speaking done wrong and you simply condemn the person. We shouldn't do that. Uh, but we do need to make judgments about things and we, we do it all the time. And in fact, if you're not doing that, um, and I'm not going to necessarily recommend this to the bishop, but if, if, you know, if we are not making judgments, we should all be fired. <laughs> because we all have to make a judgment about it th throughout the day. And so we have to judge, we have to make judgments. Our conscience is there, to, is the capacity to make those judgments properly. And so, conscience is a judgment of reason. Notice, of reason. It's not a judgment of feeling. It's not a judgment of public opinion. It's not the judgment of what uh, the Drudge Report or you know, CNN or Fox News or whatever else uh, happens to be saying. It's a judgment of reason, whereby the human person recognizes the moral quality of a concrete act. Let's just pause there. No. Most of the time, when people use the term conscience, what they mean by that is, I have decided that this thought, word, or deed is okay. I have decided that. That's not the role of the conscience. We don't get to decide what is good and what is evil. We don't get to decide that. We get to discern it, to recognize it. And so the conscience is a judgment reason whereby we recognize the moral quality of a particular thought, word, or action. We got in a lot of trouble when we seized for ourselves, when we grasped for the authority to decide what is good and what is evil. This is the sin of Adam and Eve. What was the fruit of, the, what was the tree that they were forbidden to eat from? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But in, in, in the scriptural sense of it, it's not just knowing good and evil objectively. It has a sense of deciding what is good and what is evil. Claiming for oneself the authority to say, this is good, this is evil. I'm making these determinations. That is what our society does. We take things that are evil and we call them good. Nothing new under the sun. That is the power. That's the authority that Adam and Eve grasped for in the garden, wanting the fruit of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, wanting the authority to make that determination. That is not for us to decide. It is for us to discern. 
And so the conscience is that power that we have interiorly that discerns what is good and what is evil. We don't just say, well, I've decided. You know, I mean, back to Johnny. You know, and Johnny, you know, 10 years old, his conscience is, please God, is a little uh, better formed at this point. But if it were poorly formed, he would say to mom, well, I've decided that lying to you is okay. Well, it's not for him to decide. It's him to, for him to discern whether lying, uh, when to discern that lying is evil, not good. And the Catechism of the Zone says, the moral quality of a concrete act that the person is going to perform, is in the process of performing, or has already completed. We've all been there. We've all, we, we know, I mean, this is kind of dry, flat prose from the Catechism, but we all know what this means. The moral quality of a concrete act that the person is going to perform. We've all been in a situation when we are about to think, say, or do something. I, 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 don't, don't, there, there is something within us saying, that don't, don't, don't do that. Don't go there. No, don't say it. And we say it. Or we do it. And you know, don't, don't leave the coffee pot empty. Don't, don't. Go back and make another pot of coffee. You know? um, or it is in the process of performing. We've all been there. We, we've all had that nagging feeling, you know, I probably should remove myself from this conversation. I probably should get out of this situation. Nah, I'll stay. Um, or has already completed. And uh, um, theologically, this, this, this stage has already completed. Um, theologically, it's called, what was I thinking? <laughs> And you know, we leave the situation, we leave some events, and you know, gosh, you know, I, I can't believe I said that. Um, uh, I don't think this touched on morality, but but it did. It, I think it, it, it conveys this. I first met Bishop Laverde at the March for Life in 1999. Um, he knew he was coming here. And Senior McMurtry knew he was coming here, but I don't think anybody else knew. But he was in the martial life standing with Archbishop O'Brien. Archbishop O'Brien. And here's Bishop Liberty. I never heard of him. Ogdensburg? Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went up and I, I greeted Archbishop O'Brien, who was my rector in the seminary, and chatted with him. He introduced me to, to Bishop Liberty. I said, Nice to meet you, Bishop Liberty. And that, that was about the end of it. And then a couple days later, it was announced Bishop Liberty's from Darlington. And so talk about, uh, you know, acts, concrete act that has already been completed. And I went, oh no, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> or how, how bad was it that, that I did say? And so that's, you know, what was I thinking? That is, um, that's the role of the conscience. And so uh, the conscience operates before, during, and after these specific concrete acts, to gauge their moral quality. Think of it as sort of a fire alarm or a smoke detector. It is there to give you warning, right? And uh, it's really annoying, a smoke detector that is always going off, really, you know, for no reason. You know, you, you, you burn the toast a little bit and it goes off. That's really annoying. Or the ones that keep beeping, you can't figure out which one it is. So you keep chasing them around the house trying to find them. Um, the only thing worse than that is the smoke detector that does not go off when it should. Now that's really annoying if there's a fire and the smoke detectors are not going off. That's the kind of conscience, unfortunately, that a lot of people have. It's not alerting them to the danger. Not saying don't do this, you shouldn't do this, stop. You shouldn't be doing this, you should not have done that. So, we want to form the conscience in such a way that it accuses us properly, so that it says, don't do this, don't be doing this, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, that is uh, the goal of formation, that is um, its purpose. Um, I want to skip to that quote by Cardinal Ratzinger, who now has a different name, by the way. 
Uh, he has a, a great talk he gave, actually, at an American bishop called Conscience and Truth. Two things that most people put, put at odds with one another, conscience and truth. You've heard of Catholic guilt, right? I like Catholic guilt. Okay. Gordon Gecko agreed is good. Um, my spin on that is guilt is good. Why? Because it shows that we have a conscience. And I know they don't enjoy it when they come in and they, 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 they hear me say it, but very often people will come into the confession and they say, well, Father, I did this, that, and the other, and I feel awful about it. And I say, well, that's good. You should feel awful, because it makes you think we're awful. It shows you your conscience is working properly, got you here to confession, praise be to God, you get forgiveness. Cardinal Ratzinger wrote, the, path, the capacity to recognize guilt belongs essentially to the spiritual makeup of man. There, there it is. The conscience is the capacity to recognize guilt. This feeling of guilt disturbs the false, the false calm of conscience and could be called conscience's complaint against my self-satisfied existence. That's a great line. When our conscience is accusing us, the solution should not be to tell it to shut up or, or to you know, turn on the TV so we can't hear it or something like that. The response should be to heed the conscience because it's calling us out of a moral stupor. And then he concludes, it is necessary for man as the it is as necessary for man as the physical pain which signifies disturbances of normal bodily functioning. So if you uh, drop a heavy object on your foot, like you know, cartoon, you drop an anvil. We all go sitting around right animals aren't necessary. You drop it, you know, you know, you drop it right on your foot. And you don't feel pain. That's a very severe problem. Very, very bad problem. Uh, when we feel pain, is the body's way of saying, okay, something's wrong. It's alerting us to something that we need to heed. And if we don't heed it, we've got a problem. I had a kid who didn't heed this. He had, it turns out he, he had a broken wrist. He just went to the nurse, he was trying to tough it out, and he said, he said yeah, I hurt my, my, my wrist is hurting. Turns out it was broken. <laughs> well, it was hurting so that you could have, maybe 24 hours ago, gone to somebody and said, this is hurting, I need help. Okay? And the phenomenon we have in our society you know, is a lot of consciences that are hurting. But people don't know what to do with that. They don't know what to do. Um, we've got the solutions called confession. Okay, that's where the conscience uh, finds its, uh, its balm, so that it, it can, can find healing. And so the conscience is supposed to inflict guilt. Now the danger, of course, and all, all priests have encountered this, and counselors uh, as well, th those who have scruples, and, and scruples is, is really, it's not so much a moral phenomenon as it is a psycho psychological one, it is somebody's conscience is in overdrive and accusing them of every last thing. You know, maybe I took too much coffee in my mug. Okay, and maybe I need to go back and, and, and brew another pot, even though it's you know, practically full. Uh, and somebody who feels, feels obliged to go to confession repeatedly and can never be at peace, will never have peace of conscience. Now, that's generally not our society's problem, generally speaking. But that is a conscience that's in overdrive, that is accusing and, and causing the feeling of guilt unnecessarily. And it, it needs correction. But generally speaking, the problem that, uh, that, that we suffer is that the conscience has not been developed enough to accuse us um, when we need to be accused, or we're not heeding it. Guilt should be the proper accusation of the conscience, alerting us to objective moral wrongdoing. Guilt is different, different from feeling bad. And actually, the confessional, I find myself saying this a lot to people. They'll say, you know, I, I, I feel guilty for this, that, and the other, and they're confessing. And I say, well, how is that your fault? How, how are you responsible for that? I'm, like, oh, I'm not. You know, Father, I missed Mass last Sunday. Well, why did you miss Mass? Well, Father, I'm 85 years old. I'm confined to a wheelchair, and I'm three, three feet of snow on the ground. Okay, you, yeah, you, you know, you're, you're not guilty for missing that. Okay. I know, Father, that I feel bad. Okay. Feeling bad is not the same as being guilty. The conscience is, is there to help us recognize our guilt. So, 
given this tremendous power of the conscience, let's talk about the formation of it. This wonderful quote, again, from Cormoran, saying, where's Luis? He and I were talking about this. I commended Luis for thinking uh, as Cardinal Ratzinger thinks. We we're discussing this, the, uh, the, the Spanish and the English uh, terms for, for conscience, conciencia, uh, in Spanish, which gets to the Latin, uh, of course, uh, more immediately. It is literally a, literally means with knowledge. And Cardinal Ratzinger says, conscience is a co-knowing with the truth. A co-knowing with the truth. What does this look like? Well, let's get back to that analogy I use. Your cell phone or uh, the GPS. What is that signal? What, what is that that interior capacity there within that device? What's it looking for? It's looking for information that it is already designed to receive. Unless you didn't get the upgrade. <laughs> but the device is already designed to receive information that Sprint or Verizon or some satellite is transmitting. So there is, with conscience, both an interior aspect, and that's what I've been discussing so far, that interior capacity to know good and evil, to bear witness, to render judgment, to warn and to accuse. There's that interior capacity, but now we have to talk about the second dimension, which is the external dimension. That interior capacity, and this, we're very thankful for, for technology to, for giving us this analogy, that interior capacity needs to be synced. It needs to be synced with what is true. So if you have a GPS system uh, in your car, and you're going someplace that you've never been before, and you need directions, but you decide, you know what? I'm tired of that satellite telling me what to do all the time. You know? That that authoritarian, autocratic satellite saying, turn right, turn left, turn right. <laughs> I'm disconnecting from the satellite. I'm going to go my own way. Okay, that could end very, very badly. Or, if you have not taken the, the necessary precautions to make sure that your device is up to date, you know, now what's going on? You're traveling with out-of-date information. In other words, you're not in accord with the truth. So, I, gosh, I thought that road still existed. <laughs> I guess it came to an end. I, I thought that was a left turn. Turns out it was a right. Um, and so your GPS needs to be synced with the satellite in order for it to, to function properly. Same thing with our conscience. In order for our conscience to give the proper commands, do this, don't do that, it needs to be synced with what is true. It needs to be brought into conformity. It needs to be formed. And it is formed in accord, of course, with the truth. This is why objective truth and freedom of conscience are not enemies. They're made for each other. To say that they're enemies would be like saying that the GPS in your car and the satellite somewhere up in space are mortal enemies. They're opposed to you. They're not. They're made for each other. And if they're not sinking, you're in trouble. Your conscience and the truth are made for one another. They're designed to work together. And one without the other uh, looks awfully funny and becomes very dangerous. So a conscience, that interior capacity that is not synced with objective truth, that just becomes every man for himself. Well, I think this is right. Well, I think this is right. And how do you resolve those? Just by force. <clears throat> by brute force. That's it. Because there's no appeal to objective truth. But objective truth, without a regard for, for its need to be brought to the, to the person, well, that, that can be just kind of like a billy club, right? And, and use, using the truth like a baseball bat and just getting people to do what you want them to do. Well. Uh, okay, the truth is there to, 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 to help us, but it always needs to be communicated in the proper way so that we can receive it. And so formation is always sort of that, that proper sinking of things. Another analogy, uh, perhaps, to, to help clarify this, and I appeal to the IT department now and appeal to OPCF for uh, 
um, for this. So uh, imagine we're building a new church, okay, and we have a um, we have varying standards of measurement for building this church. Okay, so uh, you know the the, the um, they come in the, the guys who are framing the church. They use one standard of measurement for them. One foot is 12 inches. And then the electricians come in and they wire everything. But for them, one foot is 11 inches. And then the guys come in to do all the piping and the HVAC. And for them, uh, one foot is 13 inches. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to have a very, very messed up church, right? Uh, because we've got not, nobody's on the same page. The conscience is, as a friend of mine likes to put it, is a ruled ruler. So imagine you have a ruler, like your conscience is a ruler that you keep with you at all times, and you're, you're going through life, and you're, and you're measuring the moral quality of acts. So you're about to say something, you take out your moral ruler, and you measure it, and say, okay, this, 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 this is okay, or no, no, this is off. Um, well, in order for that ruler to work properly, it needs to be calibrated it needs to be the proper measurement. And if you discover that the ruler or the standard measurement that you've been using this whole time uh, actually was wrong, the factory got it wrong. You know, the factory issued a, you an 11-inch foot. Well, then, then you, you want to get that corrected. Or the fire alarm. You want to make sure it's, it's calibrated properly so that it doesn't scream fire when there is no fire and so that it doesn't remain silent when there is a fire. So it is a moral measuring stick. It must be properly calibrated. The conscience will be formed. It will be formed. Who will form it? And especially those of you who have children, work with children. Um, who will form the conscience? There are a lot of people in society who would love to form consciences. They would love to. Um, uh, last uh, last Sunday, then no, I guess the Sunday before we had uh, Catechetical Sunday, and I I promised the the uh, the parents and the entire parish that we were going to indoctrinate our children, and I said that just for fun to get everybody's attention. And when you use indoctrinate in front of a whole crowd in the 21st century, they go, oh my God! And they imagine thumb screws in the rack and you know all sorts of creative medical tortures. You know, to get the indoctrination going. Well, technically speaking, that's precisely what we do. We are taking doctrine, which is good, and we're putting it into people. That's what we want to do. We want to take the doctrine, for example, of the Incarnation, or the Trinity, or the Eucharist. We want to put it in the person. Make sure that person's living according to it. Okay. Um, children are being indoctrinated left, right, and center in our culture. But the indoctrinators are uh, it's mostly the media. It's what the kids are listening to. It's their music, it's their movies, it's the videos, uh, it's one another. Uh, they, these are the places that are forming the conscience. Well, we want to make sure that consciences are being formed in accord with what is true, with, in, with, in accord with, with uh, God's truth. You want to make sure that your GPS system uh, is in sync with the manufacturer, not with anyone else. Well, how do we get the conscience properly formed? We got to get in touch with the manufacturer, God. We 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 want that the formation to come from Him. And if nobody else is doing it, then what will form the conscience are passions. Okay, so you know the semi-sophisticated high school or college student who uh, has. Uh, jumped the gun on sexual relations and is having sexual relations well before he should and says, as he might sometimes, to the priest who has called him out on this, say, well, you know, my conscience doesn't mean it's okay. I don't think it's your conscience that was saying that. Okay. I think it's your passions that told you that overrode your conscience and, and are kind of dragging your conscience through the mud. And, and now you're mistaking your passions for your conscience. So if we don't make a deliberate effort to form our conscience and those of, uh, the, the conscience of those entrusted to us, they will be formed by the media uh, or by our own passions. 
And so the formation is very necessary because, in the, the next section here, we must choose in accord with the conscience. We must choose in accord with the conscience. Um, now, and this is this is the truth uh, that uh, that people touch on when they say I have to follow my conscience. Absolutely right. So let's just very basically, we always have to do what is good and avoid what is evil. And the best way we can gauge that in any concrete situation is by way of our conscience. Because Bishop Lerberti is not going to be at your elbow at every step of the way saying, no, 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 don't do that, do this. Okay? Uh, Pope Benedict, he's not going to be there every step of the way. He doesn't want to be. Okay? This is why Cardinal Newman called the conscience the aboriginal vicar of Christ. Because the vicar of Christ, the Pope, he can't be with you at all times. Okay, you know, um, excuse me, your point is, should I have the wheat or the rye? What do you think? You know, he, he can't answer every little question that we have. Uh, the conscience, you know, should, should, you know, should I have a second helping? What do you think? The conscience is there to bear witness to Christ's teaching well before the Pope even does. They are not at odds with one another, the conscience and the Pope. But the conscience is the Pope's best friend, provided that it is well formed. We have to follow the conscience, because it is the most immediate knowledge we have of right and wrong, of good and evil. And because we have to follow it, we have to make sure that it is formed properly. So, we turn then to, to this section called um, uh, the erroneous judgment. Okay, the, uh, what happens <laughs> when the conscience is not giving good advice? What happens when we are making a bad decision? But we're fine with it because our conscience has said it's okay. Now, just because the conscience says something's okay, doesn't mean that it is okay. If I, in all sincerity, and with a clear conscience, get on the shuttle, you know, the Delta shuttle to New York, and I, with a very clear conscience, and in all sincerity, I am convinced that this is the Delta shuttle to Boston. I, I'm still gonna end up in New York. I'm not gonna end up in Boston. So just because I do something with a clear conscience, it doesn't make it morally right. It is still objectively wrong. And uh, it's my conscience that needs to be corrected. Um, just because I'm sincere doesn't make every single act one of my actions correct. If I sincerely think that I'm getting on a, a different plane, I'm still going to end up in, in the wrong place. And so, what do we make it, what do we make of this situation when somebody in ignorance, with an erroneous conscience, chooses the wrong thing? Um, second paragraph under that section. Um, well, the, the, um, if it is in, let me just first say, if the ignorance is invincible, in other words, I had no way of knowing better. I had no way of, of, of knowing differently than what my conscience told me. Well, then, then we are innocent of moral guilt. What we did is still wrong. We are innocent of moral guilt. But what if we did have a way? What if the failure is ours? And so, it's that the second paragraph there. This ignorance can often be imputed to personal responsibility. Father, I didn't know last Wednesday was a holy day of obligation. Well, you should have. <laughs> That's your responsibility as a Catholic. Um, this is a case when a man takes little trouble to find out what is true and good, or when conscience is by degrees almost blinded through the habit of committing sin. And so, that, that, so either we are delib we are neglectful for our own fault of finding out what is true, or through a habit of sin that we ourselves have placed we, that we have placed ourselves in, we blind our conscience to what we have the ability to know. 
And then the catechism says, in such cases, a person is culpable for the evil he commits. Um, that second quote there from Cardinal Ratzinger, this is a very powerful one. It is never wrong to follow the convictions one has arrived at. In fact, one must do so. When we're confronting a, a, a moral a situation, we need to gauge the moral quality of it. We have to make the judgments and proceed according as best we can. But it can be very well it can very well be wrong to have come to such askew convictions in the first place by having stifled the protest of the anamnesis of being. We're all familiar with the anamnesis of being, right? Right. Okay. Uh, he, he's talking about sort of that 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 um, that, that memory and this means that 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 is that knowledge that we all have sort of innate within us of good and evil. And we can stifle that. We tend to throughout our lives. The guilt lies then in a different place, much deeper. Not in the present act, not in the present judgments of conscience, but in the neglect of my being, which made me deaf to the internal promptings of truth. That satellite is always trying to get in touch with the GPS system. But we have a habit of turning the system off. For this reason, Criminals of conviction, like Hitler and Stalin, are guilty. <laughs> Hitler cannot stand before God and say, you know, in good conscience, I thought that was okay. He can't do that. No. It, 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 we would all recognize that. What were the Nazis convicted of in Nuremberg? Crimes against humanity. Well, where are those written? This is what he means by the anamnesis of being. You don't need to write down where the crimes of okay, we should probably include, you know, exterminating millions on the basis of religion and race. Okay. No, you don't need they're not written down anywhere. We don't need anyone to tell us these things. We we know these things are true. And so Hitler and Stalin can't say, well, yeah, gosh, a good conscience. I, I thought that was okay. It's you know, all right for me to exterminate millions. And then Colonel Ratzinger goes on. These crass examples should not serve to put us at ease. In other words, no fair leaning back and say, well, you know, I'm no Hitler, so I'm in the clear. <laughs> should not serve to put us at ease, but should rouse us to take seriously the earnestness of the plea, free me from my unknown guilt. It's from the Psalms. In other words, boy, I hope that I'm not stifling the voice of truth within me. I hope that I am giving God enough room within me to form the conscience. I hope that I'm opening the passageways of my soul so that the Holy Spirit can breathe freely within me and uh, bring to my attention what I'm doing wrong. One of the most beautiful things that we priests are privileged to witness is a soul who is has, starts going to confession regularly, monthly, or or every, every two weeks, and who grows in a sense of um, of past uh, the, the, the horror of past sins, and what it looks like very often is the person will be um, will feel just awful, say, and feel like like he needs to come back and confess them all over again. At which point the priest has to say, "No, you're not guilty all over again." But what's happening is the soul is growing. growing is growing closer to the truth, to the light. And so it's seeing itself more clearly. And it's not always easy, but it's a beautiful thing, because now I can see where it's failing before, and now that I can see it, I can correct it. And I can grow in my relationship with God. Free me from my unknown guilt. So, and then um, this final paragraph, again from the Catechism, and I've touched on this already. If, on the contrary, the ignorance is invincible, or the moral subject is not responsible for his erroneous judgment, the evil committed by the person cannot be imputed to him. It remains no less an evil, a privation, a, a disorder. One must, therefore, work to correct the errors of moral conscience. No fair shrugging our shoulders and saying, well, if they think it's okay, then you know, I'll leave them be. 
Well, no, we, we want to bring the conscience to a full awareness of the truth. We want it to rejoice in the, the proper uh, relationship with the truth that it's designed for. So, let me speak a little bit now about um, the relationship of the conscience to the church. And this is something that's very controversial. And a lot of mischief uh, has been done by opposing the conscience and the church. The conscience and church authority. And it takes the form of saying, well, I know the church says that. And it's usually about the sexuality issues. I know the church says that, but in my conscience, I don't agree. Okay, well, the difficulty here is, is uh, among several. The church is the voice of truth. Uh, that is the purpose of the truth uh, of the church. Um, Carl Newman calls the church the oracle of truth. You know, always speaking the truth. Uh, Hadley Arcus, he's a, um, not technically in our diocese, but he comes to mass in our diocese. Anyway, he just converted, he's a, a Jewish convert to the faith, and he, in his witness um, testimony about his conversion, he says he came to believe in the church as a truth-telling institution. It's a great line, a truth-telling institution. That is the essence of the, ch of the church, why we have the year of faith and the importance of evangelization. The church preaches, proclaims the truth. Our conscience is made for that. And so if we accept the church uh, as a truth-telling institution, we should also accept the church's teaching to form our consciences. And also, if we fall into a little schizophrenia, we say, well, I will accept the power of the church to testify to the truth when it tells me that bread and wine become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. But I will not accept the church as a truth-telling institution. I will not accept its authority when it tells me about sexual morality or, uh, or, or, or social justice. And so that there's, there's an economy, there's a schizophrenia there. I want, I want that, that truth authority in one regard, but not in another. The voice of the church is the friend of the conscience. It frees us from error. It guides us to what is true. It's not always easy. Why should it be? We live in a fallen world. Our consciences uh, are difficult to form. And so we form our consciences, first of all, by the church's teaching. This would be a shock to most Catholics. To be Catholic really means to accept the church as the formator of your conscience. That's what it means. Yes, I will allow the church to form my conscience. Uh, this is why the church has the power to say, you know, go to Mass on August 15th. And if you don't, it's under pain of moral sin. <clears throat> if you deliberately, you know, knowingly, willingly skip Mass. Uh, that, that's an extraordinary power that the church has, extraordinary authority. Uh, to be Catholic means I, I'm accepting this authority, and I'm accepting it as the formator of my conscience, so that I may know the evil accurately and not be subject to popular culture or my own passions. So the church's teaching is one way to, uh, to, um, to form our conscience. The church's sacraments, because remember I, I mentioned earlier that disordered passions blind us to the truth. And so my conscience can't operate properly if my passions are all are all out of whack, uh, or, you know, the passions, especially of anger and of lust, tend to blind us, and they hurt the ability of the, of the conscience to be formed. The grace of the sacraments has, as one of its effects and purposes, is to bring the passions into proper order, so that we are getting angry about the right things in the right way. Okay? We're not firing someone because he forgot to brew a cup of pot of coffee. Okay? Um, and, and so also then our sexual desires are in their proper place. I desire for food and drink in the proper place. And so on with all of the passions. The grace of the sacraments brings them into order. Um, Really, we should put Catholic Charities Counseling out of business, right, in, in, in this way. If everything works properly, right, the sacraments would just, you know, make, make, make that uh, no longer necessary. But that would be the complete grace of nature. We don't want to do that. We still need those natural helps, which brings me to the next point. 
a good moral life, striving to live morality, availing ourselves of those natural means for proper moral living in order to have clarity of conscience. Our Lord says to Nicodemus, those who do right come to the truth so that their, may, their deeds may be seen as it has done in God. That, and that's something that we know. If, if, I'm, if I'm already living correctly, if I'm already trying to live correctly, well, then I'm more open to hearing the truth, aren't I? But if I'm willfully living an immoral life, no, I, I close myself off uh, to the voice of truth. So um, C.S. Lewis calls this just pretending. It's a chapter in your Christianity, pretending. He just talks about just but you pretend that you're courageous, and after a while, you know what? You'll find yourself that you're actually doing courageous things. Okay, so if we strive to live morality, then our conscience is is uh, brought to greater clarity. Um, finally, uh, some specific things for um, some specific practices. A daily examination of conscience. It can be at night, it can be midday, in the evening, whenever is best for you. But all of the great spiritual masters recommend daily examination of conscience. Take 15 minutes. St. Ignatius would dispense his men from every other form of prayer except this one. The, the exam. So extraordinarily important. Reflecting on the time since our last examination, every thought, word, and deed going over it. Where did I fail the Lord? Where was He calling to me and I failed to respond? Where was He present and I knew He was there and I didn't respond? Or I did respond. Because examination of conscience should also bring to our mind, bring to our attention, those things that we did good so that we continue to do what is good. Uh, the examination of conscience daily, regular, by which I mean at least a monthly confession. Think about what a better world it would be if monthly each person in the world was thinking about how he or she could do better in the moral sphere. It'd be so much better. Uh, now add into that the grace of the sacraments, and we've got a pretty good world. Okay, so regular monthly confession, especially for parents. I always encourage this with, with, with engaged couples. Uh, monthly confession. It's good for kids to see their parents in line for confession. Because the kids know. <laughs> they know that mom and dad haven't been perfect. And <laughs> just, yeah, mom's confessing that she yelled at me too much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but not only that, it's sort of enlightened self-interest. Parents can't reasonably expect their children to obey them, to be subordinate to them, if they're not going to be subordinate to God. So, uh, confession. Finally, finally, as we're approaching elections, uh, th this is extraordinarily important because we have uh, because the church should be the formula of our conscience, and we should vote according to our conscience. You hear that phrase, vote according to your conscience. And, and, and most Americans will say, yeah, that's right, I'm just, you know, whatever I think, whatever I feel, I'm going to vote that. Um, for us as Americans, who are Catholics as well, that should be, you know, we vote according to our conscience that has been formed by the church. And so that we're familiar with the church's te the social teaching. We're familiar with those issues that are the non-negotiables, in other words, the distinction between an intrinsic uh, moral evil, such as uh, abortion or a violation of religious freedom or um, same-sex unions, uh, and then and then those that made a prudential judgment, uh, many of the, the, the economic or uh, so, so, so other social teachings, uh, in which we still need to heed uh, the instructions and the teachings of the church, so that we're not running you know roughshod over over the church. Uh, in, in order to get sort of what we want in the state house. Um, there is no greater blessing in this life to, to have a peaceful conscience. Um, many things can be taken from us. All of our possessions can be taken away. 
our physical freedom and health can be taken, can be violated. Uh, our very lives can be taken away. But a peaceful conscience can never be taken from us. That is something that we can only surrender uh, ourselves. There is no greater blessing and no assured, uh, really, serenity than that peaceful conscience which, which comes from having our conscience in accord with the truth and heeding it faithfully so that we are always at peace, uh, both within us and in union with the Lord.